All right, welcome back everyone. So today's lecture, we're going to finally get into the vertebrates. Um, these are animals that have a, a vertebral column and they're gonna be most, uh, most of them are going to be quite familiar to you. Uh, maybe the few that we'll talk about are kind of uh, different, but let's get right into it. So we'll start with the fishes. Um, fishes are the earliest vertebrates and of those fishes, the jawless fishes were the earliest of uh, those. Um, jawless fishes, which are your present day hagfishes and lampreys, they have a distinct cranium and they have complex sen sense organs, including the eyes. And that distinguishes them from, their in, uh, from the invertebrate cor uh, chordates, the ones that don't have vertebral columns. The jawed fishes will evolve later and those first three gill arches are what are modified to become the jaw. Fishes are active feeders rather than sessile or suspension feeders. And first, let's like take a look at the, um, we'll describe the jawless fishes. So here's the Mycenae, and it's actually not a vertebrate, and I'll tell you why. Um, but it's a hagfish, a jawless fish. There are 67 species or so. They are eel-like scavengers that live on the ocean floor and feed on dead invertebrates, other fishes and marine mammals. There's actually a really interesting video of like a bunch of these guys eating a dead whale on the bottom of the ocean. Kind of gross, but also pretty interesting. Um, they are entirely marine species and they enter dead organisms and eat them from the inside out. It's really, really gross looking. But like I said, there's a video you can look up on YouTube. Um, and they are not a vertebrate because they uh, possess that notochord at adulthood. It hasn't turned uh, into a vertebral column yet, and you can tell that they're able to really just tie themselves in knots because of that. So pretty cool. Here is the lamprey. Um, the lamprey are uh, jawless fishes, and they are vertebrates, but lamprey are vertebrate parasites. They attach themselves to organisms on the outside using a sucker cup, and they drink the blood of organisms. And this absolutely devastates um, populations of lake trout and other fish. Um, and the United States and Canada, you spend millions of dollars every year, uh, hundreds of million do millions of dollars every year to control the lamprey populations in the Great Lakes. Um, because, like I said, they decimate the uh, the fish in there, and that poses tons of problems with the rest of the ecosystem, um, as well as fisheries. And so these guys are a really big problem um, that we have to spend millions of dollars on every year. And then we'll get into the jawed fishes. One of the most significant developments in early vertebrate evolution is the origin of the jaw. And of course, the jaw, if you're aware, is a hinged structure attached to the cranium, and it allows animals to grasp and tear its food. And eventually what that means is it allows animals to eat larger organisms. It allows early nathostomes, or basically organisms with a jaw, to exploit food resources that were previously unavailable to jawless fishes. Okay, so let's get into types of jaw jawed fishes. First are the chondrichthys. These are your sharks, rays, skates, sawfishes, and ghost sharks. They have paired fins, and a skeleton made of cartilage. That's the big point here. Chondrichthys are skeleton, have skeletons made of cartilage. Most cartilaginous fishes live in marine habitats, but there's a few species living in freshwater for some or all of their lives. Most sharks are carnivores. They feed on live prey. We're pretty familiar with that, right? Um, they either swallow it whole or they use their jaws and teeth, tear it up into little smaller pieces. Here are your sharks. So really, really cool organisms. Um, sometimes they get a, a bad rap. They're, you know, what we do to them is far worse than what they've ever done to us, um, but pretty interesting. Then the rays and the skates, they are, um, they can be distinguished from sharks by, of course, their flattened bodies, pectoral fins that are enlarged and fused to the head, and gill slits on their ventral surface. So there's the gill slits right here. Then the osteichthys, or the bony uh, skeleton fish, it's pretty much all other fish at this point. So I just put a bunch of other pictures of all types of fish, um, all types of colors and sizes. But if you have, uh, have a bony skeleton, you are in the osteichthys, and that's actually what that means. So at some point, vertebrates make it to land. And here is 
um, a coelacanth, and this is a fish that was previously thought to be extinct until at some point we find that they are still around, and they are basically the the earliest ancestor of an organism that is not around anymore that eventually makes it to land. Um, scientists are still not sure what groups would give rise to the amphibians. It's theorized what that organism would look like. Um, you can look that up, and it's most likely that are, they are related to the lungfish or the coelacanths. So one of these two probably evolved into a slightly different organism that becomes the first amphibian. Amphibians, they are tetrapod vertebrates, that means having four uh, appendages. Um, amphibian means double life, it's a pretty good example of why names work in biology. Um, those are your frogs, salamanders, and the Sicilians. Those are snake-like amphibians. Tetrapods, of course, are characterized by having four limbs. They are vestigial in some salamanders and in all Sicilians, which are snake-like amphibians. But they do, by the way, vestigial means that they are still there. They're just much smaller. And sometimes you'll only see little small bones where limbs used to be. Um, the the term amphibian for having a double life is quite a good um it's quite a good way to describe them uh when you think of frogs that lay their eggs in water basically um they these eggs cannot survive without moisture they cannot survive on land they need to have a, a, a supply of water and and uh, the tadpoles when they hatch from these eggs um, live in water for the for the majority of their early lives and then frogs can come on land um, and do their thing as adults mate and 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 whatnot so that term double life of living in the water and living on the land is a pretty good descriptor here's an example of frog development where it starts as a tadpole it begins to grow legs lose the tail and become an adult uh, in the end then we can get into our reptiles and birds, the amniotes, reptiles, birds, and mammals, their terrestrially adapted shelled egg, and an embryo protected by amniotic membranes. Those are your amniotes. So then now these eggs that are being produced have a shell that allows them not to desiccate or basically dry out. The amniotic sac means that amniotes could develop in an aquatic environment on the land. Reptiles are tetrapods, snakes, also are tetrapods, they just have vestigial limbs. Um, they lay shelled eggs on the land, like I said. One of the key adaptations that permitted reptiles to live on land was the development of their scaly skin. It contains this protein, like you have in your skin, called keratin and waxy lipage, and that just prevents water loss from the skin so that you don't absolutely just dry out. You don't have to be in a, an aquatic environment all the time like um, amphibians. Um, reptiles are ectotherm. What that means is that they are animals whose main source of body heat comes from their environment. So they have to be, you know, sitting in the sun to warm up, unlike us, where we can warm up based on our, our own internal body heat. Um, behavioral maneuvers like basking to heat themselves or seeking shade or burrows to cool off will help them regulate their body temperature. Class Reptilia includes diverse species um, classified into four living clades, the Crocodilia, the Sphenodontia, the Squamata, and the Testodines. So let's take a look at all those. Here's Crocodilia, pretty much in the name there, crocodiles and alligators, um, very interesting organisms, very uh, dinosaur-like in their, in their look and in when they were uh, around when they first developed. So they're very hardy organisms, have been around for a long, long time. Then the Sphenodontia, this lizard-like organism, it's called a tuatara. Um, really interesting organisms. Maybe you've never heard of this guy before, um, but kind of looks like a crocodile that has uh, that lives on the land. Really interesting organisms. Again, that's the tuatara. Here's the squamata, your lizards and skinks um, and snakes. So really interesting organisms as well. I guess snakes aren't everyone's cup of tea, but I do like them. Here's a uh, leopard gecko, here's a skink, and here is a uh, blue tongue skink. So really cool um, organisms. I just love reptiles. Here's the testodines, including your tortoises and your turtles. What's the difference? A turtle lives in the water. A tortoise lives on the land for the most part. Um, so there's testodines. And then birds. So we come to birds, and 
Birds are reptiles, in case you didn't know that, um, but they display a number of traits that make them different from reptiles. One thing to note is that the feathers are actually modified scales. And so that's just a little fun fact for you, but birds are reptiles, perhaps you didn't know that. Um, but the, what makes them different is that they are endothermic, meaning that they can heat their body through their own metabolic processes, they don't have to sit in the sun. That's why these organisms can live in very, very cold environments. And like I said, their feathers are modified scales. Okay, we get it to mammals now. Mammals are vertebrates, but they have hair and mammary glands. Mammary glands produce milk to provide nutrition for their young. The presence of hair is one of the key characteristics of a mammal, and it traps a layer of heat, and it also blocks sunlight and things like that. But that is a key characteristic of mammals, having hair and mammary glands. Hair can also be a sensory organ in terms of whiskers, um, camouflage, and let's look at um, mammals here. So here's the monotremes. Monotremes are mammals. The platypus here, really interesting looking organisms, and the echidnas. Um, interestingly enough, monotremes actually lay an egg but the females keep it in their reproductive tract till it's ready to hatch and then they release the egg uh, right as it's about to hatch. So it's really, really interesting organisms, quite different from the rest of the mammals. Um, here are the marsupials, and including the North American marsupial, uh, the opossum, but most of the other marsupials are found primarily in Australia and neighboring islands. Again, you've got opossums here, but kangaroos, koalas, here's the bandicoot, and not pictured as the Tasmanian devil. Then the eutherian mammals, which means placental mammals, the one mammals that have live young. Um, and that, well, just before I go, that's look, your dogs, your cats, your tigers, your apes, including us as humans, we are eutherian or placental mammals. So I'll leave you with this video of one of my favorite animals, uh, the slow loris. These guys are unfortunately uh, trapped and taken away from their mothers uh, to be sold on the black pet market. Um, but I'll just give you a, a minute or two to watch this guy. see he's got really large eyes that's going to help him see in the forest at night you can see that he's got hair he would have mammary glands again i'm saying he i don't know if this is a male or female um, but you can see also that he's got opposable thumbs to help to grab things like food and the tree limbs um, really cute looking guy So this guy is a eutherian or a placental mammal. They're going to have live young. With that, I think I will leave you, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Have a good one.